Today's word is really, really important as we're talking in this series, Taking Ground. And we all want to take ground personally. We certainly want to take ground corporately as church and churches in this family together. And as the lockdown lifts, in some places at least, we're really reaching to God to see a mighty harvest in the days ahead. But I need to tell you that the message that I'm going to share with you today, I've called The Exchanged Life. And of course, we're looking at the book of Joshua and its parallel New Testament equivalent, the book of Ephesians. Let me just tell you about this message, The Exchanged Life. I think it's probably one of the biggest lessons I've ever learned in my ministry life. And saying learned, I'm still learning it. It's the place where I need to live and want to live. And this message that I'm bringing you today has brought me great comfort so many times and so many occasions, especially when I'm facing challenges concerning taking ground. So I'm praying that God will help you really, really hear the message today, especially if you're a leader amongst us. Maybe you're moving out to take up new responsibilities. Maybe you're preparing to start a new project or a new church plant. This message is for you in particular, but it's of course for everybody. We've had Joshua chapter 24 read for us already, but let me read some verses from Ephesians so that it sets the scene for us as we come into the word today. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 9. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Someone once said that all Christians have eternal life, and that's good news, right? You're going to live forever. But not all Christians have abundant life. And when we're looking at the book of Joshua and the book of Ephesians, we're talking about taking ground and coming into everything that Jesus has done for us. I think it would be true to say, perhaps, that as Christians, some of us are the right side of Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection and the new birth that Jesus has given to us, but the wrong side of Pentecost. We haven't come into the dynamic and the dimension of the Holy Spirit yet. But you know what? God wants you to come into the abundant life that he has for you. The title to today's message, The Exchange Life, is not original to me. I first found it said by Hudson Taylor, the very famous missionary to China. Some people called him the father of modern missions. He did so much for the kingdom of God. And he said that this was the secret to his very fruitful and very effective life, the exchanged life. So let's talk about taking ground, looking at Joshua 24 and Ephesians chapter 2 and the exchanged life. There's three things I want to tell you today. The first thing is this. If we want to take ground, move forward, bear fruit, be productive, have a life that's worth living, we're going to have to have a very significant revelation. What's revelation? Revelation is when you really, truly see something, especially with the eyes of your spirit. We read in the Ephesian verses earlier that everything concerning our salvation, our eternal life, and even our abundant life started with God. The two, verse, the two words we read as we looked at those verses, it's, but God... 
Right? We were dead. We were lost. We were a hopeless case. The Bible didn't say we were sick in our sins or tired in our sins. It says we were dead, dead, dead. And dead people can't do anything to save themselves. But God, it all started with him and it continues with him. But I don't know if you noticed, but in the reading that was read to us from Joshua chapter 24, 17 times in 12 short verses, the divine personal pronoun is used. In other words, God is speaking in the first person and he's saying, I, 17 times. Now, chapter 24 of Joshua is a summing up of the whole book. It's a, an ending of all that's gone before. And Joshua has called both the leaders and the people together. He's now old. He's getting ready to go to be with the Lord. But he's giving them this farewell speech. And as he's giving it, he's prophesying in effect because God is speaking in the first person. And 17 times, that's a lot of times, right? God speaks directly. And we read things like this. God says, I took your father Abraham. Then we read, I sent Moses and Aaron. Then we read, I brought your fathers out of Egypt. Then we read, I gave your enemies into your hands. And you know what? We need a revelation that God started it, God continues it, and God will end it. You see, it's so easy to forget that God did it all in our lives. There was nothing that we could add to our own salvation. God saved you. God filled you with the Holy Spirit. God set you free. And I know many of you personally, God set you free from alcohol. God set you free from, from drug addiction. God, God set you free from a negative lifestyle. God set you free from it. God did it. We must never forget it's God. It's God at the beginning, God in the middle, and God at the end. It's all God. And you know what? It's so easy that when we have a few successes under our belt and we have some great testimonies to report on, we start telling people how we did it and what I've done and what I've accomplished. But you know what? The revelation we need to carry is it's always God. Every good thing that ever happened in my life was God. Every miracle that I've seen, and I've seen many, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every breakthrough that we had was the direction, the leading, and the power of the Holy Spirit. God did this. We must never forget it's God. And listen, whatever situation you are in, in your city or in your country, some are going into a lockdown. We're hoping to come out of a lockdown here. As we enter the new season that's before us, God took care of us before and God's going to take care of us in this situation. Some of us are facing challenges that are immense. We have no hope. It's God and our hope is in him, but God. And there's an interesting verse in that Joshua chapter 24 story that was read for us. It's verse 12. Listen, this is what it said. Don't know if you noticed it. I sent the hornet before you and drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you. It wasn't your sword and it wasn't your bow. I sent the hornet before you. You ever noticed that verse? In fact, back in Deuteronomy and in Exodus, God promises them that he'll send the hornet before them. And many commentators have stopped and thought, who or what is this hornet? The word hornet literally means a stinging wasp or a stinging bee. And some people think, you know, did, did God send a, a huge swarm of wasps before them? Possibly. But I think if that had happened, we'd have had other reports on it. I am more inclined to think that this hornet is the same 
person that's spoken of as the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord will go with you and the angel of the Lord will go before you. I actually think it's the same person that appeared to Joshua early on in this book who said, I come now as captain of the army of the hosts of the Lord. In other words, there is a sting inside to God Almighty and he knows how well to take out your enemies of disease and cancers and he knows how well to take out those enemies that would stand against you and speak against you. He knows how well to move forward and that's what he was saying to them in, Judge, in Joshua chapter 24. He was saying, listen, I did this. I took out your enemies. I brought you in. I sent Moses and Aaron. I even called Abraham that far back. And I want to tell you, never forget the really important I, the big I in your life. And it's not you. It's not me. It's him. Do you remember what God said to Moses when he said, who shall I say sent me when he was being commissioned to go and confront Pharaoh? Just said, I am. And that great I am is engaged with your life. If God is for us, who then can be against us? Or what can be against us? And you know, we have to be very careful, especially when we get victories and successes that we never think that was us. We don't start writing on our websites all the stuff that we've achieved. We don't start writing accolades about ourselves and broadcasting our names as the one who's accomplished anything at all. Listen, everything to do with this church and its ministry, God did it all and he's done a great job and he's not stopped yet. The best is yet to come. I was only reflecting the other day about Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the week before his crucifixion. And do you remember how he rode on a donkey? And as he rode into, into the city, the crowd shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you remember that? Do you remember how they, they threw palm leaves down before him so that he went in on a green carpet? Those things were traditional for conquering kings. And here's Jesus coming in, riding on a donkey. I was reading that story the other day and I thought about the donkey or the jackass as Americans call them. Could you imagine being that donkey and you're carrying Jesus on your back and you're walking into Jerusalem and the crowd is shouting? It would be so easy for that donkey to think, I must be the coolest donkey in all the world. Look at this crowd throwing out palm leaves for me. Look at this crowd shouting at me. But of course, we know it wasn't the donkey at all. It was the person on his back. And you know what? We must remember, it's the person inside us. It's the Lord above us. It's the God of glory beneath us, the rock under our feet. He is the one that deserves the accolade. He is the one that is to get the glory. He is the one that's to get the credit because he is the one that's done it all. And oftentimes we tell our Destiny Call students, listen, we are not here to make a name. We're here to serve a name. Never forget the revelation that it's Jesus. It's God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit that's fully at work in your life. And every good thing, he did it. But the second thing I want to tell you is this. There has to be a divine exchange. In the chapter that was read for us, Joshua 24, there's a very odd paradox. Don't know if you noticed it. But we find Joshua speaking. Don't forget, it's the end of his life and he's leaving a message for the children of Israel. And in verse 14, we heard, read these words, Joshua speaking. Now fear the Lord and serve him. And then in verse 15, we hear these words, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. So he's charging the people, right? And then the people answer in verse 18, we will serve the Lord for he is our God. That's the right answer, isn't it? You would think. But you know what? In verse 19, Joshua comes back again and he says these words, you will not be able to serve the Lord your God. Well, why did you in verse 14 encourage them to do so then, Joshua? And in verse 15, tell them that they must make a good choice. And when they responded and said, we will serve the Lord, you now say they can't. 
Well, you might remember, and I'm sure Joshua certainly did when he said those words, of the events that happened on that terrible day when the law was given at Mount Sinai. Do you remember that? You can read it in Numbers and you can read it in Exodus chapter 20. But you know what happened? Moses came with the Ten Commandments. Twice he had to do it. And when he came with those Ten Commandments, he said to the people, here are the rules the laws, the laws of God for you to keep. And all the people said, ah, oh, we'll keep that. But of course, they didn't and they couldn't. And 3,000 died in one day. And we might think, why does God give us the law if nobody can keep it? God never gave the law for us to keep it. He gave us the law to show us that we couldn't, that the standard is so high, it's beyond us. And therefore, we must realize that even though this is what God requires, what God requires, we cannot meet. There must be an exchanged life and not just an exchanged life, a divine exchanged life. Because there was one who kept the law in every point. There wasn't a fault or a failure within him. And when he died on a cross... He died perfect in himself, but in that moment, he took all the sins of the world on him, including yours and mine. And in that moment, the Bible says, he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so, serve God, live for God, choose the Lord, but you need to know you can't keep his standards. You, you can't live this way. And so there has to be a divine exchange. Not only is the revelation of God did it all, but God is still doing it all. And even as I'm living for him, my hands go up and surrender. I can't live this life. But there is one who lives inside me now who can live it. And I'm with Paul when he said, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. And you know what? Hudson Taylor, who coined that phrase, the divine exchange, tried so hard to serve God with little success until he learned this secret. He learned this secret and then he went on to say, it's not what Hudson Taylor does for God that matters, but what God does through Hudson Taylor. And you know, Jeremiah understood the same principle. In 17 verse 5, we read this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. You see, even to live the life that God has for us, we have to surrender and let him live uh, his life through us. Although on the day of the law giving on Mount Sinai, 3,000 died, there was another day, 50 days, in fact, after the crucifixion, that was called the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell. And do you know what happened on that day? 3,000 were saved and added to the church. The numbers are not a coincidence. They are not an accident. It's a direct comparison. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. And here's the real trick. As I live my life, I surrender. I give up. And I let him live his life through me. And you know what? That's the only way to live a life that's pleasing to God. Those old habits, those old sins, those old temptations that get the better of us, the moment we surrender, that's when the power kicks in and the power comes through. I remember once being so immensely challenged in my young years as a Christian. God spoke to me in a vision and in the vision I saw a verse and the verse came out of Isaiah 40 and it said this, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up as with the wings of an eagle. And I discovered that that word renew in, in Isaiah, in the Hebrew, actually was exchange. There's an exchange taking place. So when I'm trying so hard, I'm getting agitated, and I'm getting anxious. I exchange that for the peace of God. When I face a challenge, I think in my own ability, I cannot do that. I exchange my weakness for the strength and the power of God. When I face a dilemma and a problem, I think, God, I just don't know what to do. I, I'm outsmarted by this problem. Then I exchange my ignorance for the wisdom of God and I discover I have the mind of Christ. 
And when I learn how to keep that exchange going, even though I walk through a very heated and hot world with all its challenges pressing in on me, then I find that I'm able to live in that air conditioned, that exchanging world of God in me, me in God. I want to tell you, that's the only way to live. It's one of the reasons why we should be in the word and prayer every day, not simply to have done our religious duty, but I'm exchanging my weakness for his strength, my foolishness for his wisdom, my inability for his expertise. That's how God wants us to live. And that's what Joshua meant when he says, you'll not be able to live this way, but live for it anyway, live for God anyway. But there has to be an exchanged life. And then thirdly, it's the key to the effective lifelong service. You see, out of both of those places, the place of revelation and the place of the exchanged life, comes total gratitude and surrender. We give up our inadequacy and we start serving effectively. It's not me, it's God in me. And I need to tell you, as I tell myself and challenge us all, don't take time out from serving God. Don't take time out thinking, well, I've done my bit for the last few years. Time for somebody else to have a go now. Maybe the season changes. Maybe what you're doing changes. Maybe, maybe the, the hours that you have available changes, but there never comes a moment when we stop living for him. We don't give up. We don't step back. We don't step out. We move with it and we say, Lord, I'm in this for life long service. It's not me. It's God. And I need to tell you, and some of you are very aware of this, right? That the destiny that God is taking you into is far bigger than you. It's bigger than your experience. It's bigger than your knowledge. It's bigger than what you've done before. It's bigger than your ability. But it's not bigger than God. And the key to this success in service, to the breakthrough, to the fruitfulness, to the increase, to the growth, to the taking ground, is the exchanged life. And you know what? That exchanged life has to happen constantly, day in, day out. Lord, I, I don't know how to plant this church, but you know how to do it. I don't know how to lead and grow this growth group now that we're coming out of lockdown and get people back together again, but you know how to do it. Just work through me, work with me, lead me. It's not what I can do, it's what God can do in me and through me. And do you know what I've discovered? God does amazing things through imperfect people. Let me ask you a question. Do any of you know what kindling is not kindle the ebook kindling well if you used to be in a boy scout or a girl scout or lighting fires you'll realize very quickly that you cannot light a huge log with a little match right i remember as a kid trying it you know put a little match under a huge log i could have gone through 10 boxes of matches and i would never have lit that log it would never have caught fire so what you do you get kindling small pieces of wood and you put the match to a piece of paper that ignites the kindling. And as the kindling catches, you can put bigger wood on it. And before you know it, you've got the whole huge log on fire. You know, we often pray for our nation, right? Or we pray for our city. Or we pray for our town. Or, or we pray even for our street or the area around us. Those are all big logs. Do you know how God is going to set something on fire? By taking kindling. And do you know what the kindling is or who the kindling is? You. Would you be willing to be kindling in God's hands? In other words, if he took you as a piece of kindling and dropped you into an office or dropped you into a school or dropped you into, into a hospital ward, would you be burning enough to set somebody else on fire? Would there be enough life in you that they catch it? That's what kindling is. Enough faith over the despair. In, in, enough hope over the negativity. E enough positive confession over the negative words. E enough integrity to be heard and to be listened to. That's kindling. 
And you know what? God wants us to be that kindling that he can drop you in somewhere. He can set your heart on fire. You're on fire with gratitude. You realize God saved me. God filled me with the Holy Spirit. God set me free. God healed me. God provided for me. It's God, God, God. And my heart is on fire with gratitude towards him. He's then going to drop you in somewhere like a piece of kindling. And you know what? Before you know it, there could be a fire all around you. That's actually how churches get started. Somebody goes with enough fire in their heart and others catch it. That's how revival start in nations. Somebody comes with enough fire in their heart and others get it. And you know, that's how God always does something. He picks up dry sticks who are pliable in this sense, in his hands. He puts a match of the Holy Spirit to them and away it goes we could even think of Jesus as kindling. He died a solitary death. One single man dying on a cross. Virtually all his friends and disciples had left him. There were three women there. And John, the Roman soldiers carrying out the execution were there. The jeering crowd were there. The two thieves on either side were there, but he was a single stick on his own, dying. But he was dying with fire and passion in his heart for you and for me. And that fire has set the world ablaze. Some point in my life, I came up against that stick and it set my heart on fire. The prophet in the Old Testament calls Jesus like a, like a dry stick out of arid ground. But there was fire in his heart and he has set the world on fire with the love and the grace of God. And you know what? As I read the life of Jesus, I discover that he lived that exchanged life. Even though he was the son of God in flesh incarnate, he consistently and constantly said, not my will, your will. Not my words, your words. Not my actions, your actions. Jesus lived this exchanged life and he promised that even though he was going back up into heaven, he would send another, the Holy Spirit would take off his words, reveal them to us so that we can move in that exchanged life. You've got a challenge that you feel so big, live the exchanged life. You've got a challenge before you that God has put there for you to achieve, live the exchanged life. You've got a challenge inside you that you think you can't overcome, live that exchanged life. And it all starts when we have that first big exchange and we give our lives to God and he gives his life to us. I'd love to pray with people right now. Maybe as yet you don't know Jesus personally. You haven't given your life to God. That, that great exchange has not happened for you yet. Would you let me pray with you? Maybe, maybe you've prayed a prayer at some point in the past, but you've kind of lost your way. Let me pray for you too. And maybe, may, maybe you've come to know Jesus, but you're not living an abundant life because you've not received the power of the Holy Spirit yet. I'm going to be praying for you as well. But first, listen, if you're needing God today, if you're needing a God encounter today, I'm calling on you, surrender. Put your life in his hands and let him put his life in your heart. It's already done. Jesus has forgiven you your sins. They went with him on the cross. It's already done. He's been raised from the dead to become your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is believe that and then come to the place of saying, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Come on, if you need this prayer, would you open your hands? Maybe if you're in a building, raise your hands with us so that others are aware that you're doing that. They'll be praying for you at the same time. And I know there are pastors with us online. They're going to be praying for you as well. Come on, open your hands. Let's reach together. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray for every friend that's reaching right now. Lord, everyone in every place, no matter how far they are away from my voice today, I want to thank you that geography is no problem to the dynamic life of your Holy Spirit. I pray for them that they would be saved today. Transform their lives. Break the power of darkness. Bring them into the life of heaven through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray for these getting saved that they will be filled really soon with the Holy Spirit. Commit them to you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Listen, if you are reaching with me, maybe praying that prayer alongside me, calling on God with me, we have pastors online who would love to pray with you personally. So if you're on the church online platform, you'll see a tab which says request prayer. Click on that tab and they'll connect with you immediately. Same on Facebook and YouTube. Get on the chat. There's a link. They'll connect with you there. If you're in a building today and have an opportunity, would you just raise your hand and there'll be others there who will be praying with you. And I'd love then to send you this little booklet. But just before I go, I did say I'd be praying for those people who want to be filled with the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. It's His power in us that gives us the secret to God's life. Maybe you've become a Christian already, but you haven't as yet received this fullness. Maybe as yet you're not speaking in tongues. I want to tell you it's for you and there are people online ready to pray with you today. Listen, distance is no problem. God can reach you as they pray with you. Again, get on the link where it says request prayer. Get on the chat, find the link and they will immediately connect with you. Pray for you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, even if you're listening to this on demand and catch up later, we're available. Drop us an email. Get in touch. We want to be there with you. We are your family, right? We want to do life together and see you come into every good thing God's got for you. So till next time, I'm Andrew Owen. This is Destiny Church Online. God bless. <music>